to ask questions. So what I thought I would do today or this evening is give you an update on where we stand in 2021. And importantly, some of the issues that you may see in your general practice uh, that might come your way when one of your patients has had a hip or a knee replacement. Uh, I'll skip through some of these slides quite quickly uh, in the beginning, uh, just to say that Australia is unique in that it has probably one of the best joint registries in the world. Every single joint replacement that is done in any hospital, public or private, anywhere in Australia is recorded uh, with the Australian Joint Registry. And this was started in 1988, and they started collecting data uh, in 1999. So we're uh, over 20 years now of data. And we all know that the collection of big data is really what will drive change when we see trends happening. And this is very true of our National Joint Registry, and it, it is certainly regarded as one of the jewels in the crown uh, in the Orthopaedic Association, both locally and, and internationally. And many, many publications in the orthopaedic literature quote the Australian Joint Registry. The data includes basic patient demographics, diagnosis, implant details, and recently in the last four or five years has included body mass index and ASA scores, which is a really a reflection on comorbidities. And certainly this is something, and I'll touch on it later in the talk, where general practitioners such as yourselves can make a difference to the outcome of a patient having a joint replacement. The data is collected in a beautiful building in Adelaide that was built a couple of years ago. Uh, and the data comes from all over Australia. And as I said, every patient has one of these forms filled in, either for a hip or a knee, uh, and then the, the data is sent. So what this means is that uh, if I did a hip replacement in Sydney and the patient ended up in Perth and needed a revision, I wouldn't know about it, but the joint registry would know about it and they will tell me about it when I pick up my annual reports, which shows how I'm performing in, in relation to other orthopedic surgeons. So it's an incredibly valuable tool. And I often see patients, and I'm sure you see patients as well, who will come to the office and say, well, how long is my hip going to last or my knee is going to last? And this is where we do join, uh, turn to the registry because it's got some hard evidence because the registry will tell us when a patient is revised. And so therefore we know revision rates at a period of time, which means we know how, thing, how long things will last. And there, these are 15 year outcomes. And you can see with a hip replacement at 15 years, the revision rate can be anywhere between 2.6 up to 20%. And I'm gonna to touch on why this is. And the knees between 4% and 15%. So the best performing hips at 15 years, only 2.6% have needed a revision, which means over 97% are perfectly fine and may well last a lifetime. This is Norman Sharp. 71 years ago, he had his hips replaced in England. He's the longest surviving hip replacement. And if you really are astute, you will see that these really old fashioned hip replacements, I think the only reason they're surviving is because the top of his femurs are actually articulating with his pelvis, so the hip's not actually working, but it's just sitting there. But meanwhile, he still has the, the Guinness Book of Records for the longest hip. If you look at our latest report, there are over one and a half million joint replacements in the latest report. Close to 700,000 hips and 850,000 knees. So that's an enormous amount of data that is incredibly valuable in, in saying how things are performing. But it does come back, and, and this is not, uh, this is just a general comment, to be honest, and it's well published in the literature and something that you need to always remind your patients of. But the most important factor in hip and knee replacement surgery outcomes is the surgeon, is choosing the surgeon, a surgeon who knows, who's competent in joint replacement, no matter how they do it, and who does enough, and the patient is generally going to get the best outcome. They did a study in the registry a couple of years ago saying how many joint replacements should a surgeon do to become good. So you can see if you're in the red line down here, the revision rate is less. And these are surgeons doing over 70 joints a year, as opposed to the green line, which is a surgeon only doing less than 10 a year. But saying that, if the surgeon chooses a bad implant, no matter how good a surgeon he or she is, the revision rates are going to go up. So 
This is the graph I showed you earlier. So a surgeon doing 70 joints a year or more has a low revision rate. But if that, if that surgeon used a bad implant, you can see how the revision rate goes up. So it's about choosing the right implants as well. And there has been a reduction in the revision rate of hip and knee replacements in Australia, which we attribute directly to the fact that we've been collecting the data uh, in the joint registry, because the joint registry has been steering surgeons in the right direction. And the evidence shows that the surgeons are modifying their practice based on what we see in the registry and the report comes out every year. And here's a perfect example. This is a graph showing hip and knee replacements at various time intervals. So you can see in the orange, let's look at the knee one because it's easier to look at. But if you look at the knees, between 2013 and 2018, the revision rate is less than if knees were looked at between 1999 and 2005, that green line. And the real reason this is, and it's similar on the hips, is that the registry every year says, these implants are doing well, these implants are doing badly, this combination is doing well, and then surgeons are changing their practice, if anything, becoming more conservative by following the evidence. And that is reflected in reduced, uh, in reduced revision rates. So if you look at the current thinking on hip replacements, the factors that will influence your patient's revision would be the age, their obesity, uh, and their ASA score, their comorbidities, the bearing surface that they is what's used and whether it's a male or a female or the type of replacement. But this is, the, this is an important uh, comforting graph. This is taking all total hips in Australia for the last 20 years. And you can see all comers with osteoarthritis at 20 years, the revision rate's 10%, which means 90% of patients will get to 20 years without needing a revision. So most patients current modern day hip replacements using tried and tested implants will last them a lifetime. The reasons things wear out or need revising is they might get loose, they might fracture, they, they might have a dislocation or there may be an infection. You can see infection as a cause of revision is actually quite high and it's something that we are very uh, conscious of and that they are still trying every possible avenue to try and reduce the complication of infection and this is where in your general practice, by keeping patients' diabetic control up to date, by keeping their weight down and making sure their iron levels are normal, uh, will help reduce uh, post-operative complications of a joint replacement. So age and gender, uh, two people who I uh, respect, uh, David Attenborough, he fortunately falls into the age group where he has the lowest revision rate. So the older the patient, the lower the revision rate. Uh, Andy Murray at the bottom needed a hip resurfacing to get back on the tennis court, but he will fall into the age group where they have the highest revision rate. And here you can see how as you get older, so the red is over 75, your chance of needing a revision is less. Females do slightly worse than males. That's just a fact uh, with respect to hip replacements. This is a key uh, slide for the for your patients to understand and for you to to, uh, to let them know. But patients who are obese, particularly if you are significantly obese, have a up to six times fold, six times higher incidence of a deep joint infection because of their obesity. So if you look here, here are patients who are underweight in the green, and here are patients who are in obese class three, so a BMI of greater than forty. They have a, a huge six times higher revision rate. So purely weight plays an enormous part in uh, outcomes. But saying that there are often some patients who are significantly overweight, but in significant pain, and it becomes a weighing up, what can we do to, you know, they ultimately need their joint done and do we, can we afford to wait a long time to get their weight down or not? And I personally send, you know, patients who are significantly overweight with a BMI of over 40 uh, to a bariatric surgeon for, uh, for their opinion. Here you can see their comorbidities stands to reason. The worse your comorbidities, the higher your revision rate. So factors we can modify in your practice, obesity, diabetes, and uh, hemoglobin iron levels. What about bearing surfaces? The bearing on your right is the old plastic. The bottom left is the new plastic. And I'm pleased to tell you that 
the latest bearings with the current generation plastics perform incredibly well. You can see, if you look purely at bearings, at 19 years, only 7.5% of patients with a ceramic on polyethylene bearing have needed a revision. Uh, ceramic on ceramic, slightly higher. We tend to use these in younger patients, so 8.4. And then you can see the disaster of metal on metal when it was uh, in vogue, 32% needed revision. Um, I've ha often had questions, what about, what does dual mobility mean? Dual mobility is simply a bearing. And what it is, it's two balls. It's the inner ball and the outer ball. And it just affords slightly better stability in the hip joint. And dual mobility I use more in older patients who may not be that compliant in terms of their post-op um, uh, movement restrictions initially. Uh, it just gives you a slightly safer bearing in terms of reducing the risk of dislocation. But I tend not to use them in younger patients because you've got this big plastic ball, which is ultimately going to wear out. But dual mobility is, is, is trying to give a bit more stability. We know that in older patients, gluing the stem in, cementing is the way to go. Uh, if in a young patient like that, Andy Murray, he had a resurfacing, so one of these. But you can see that even resurfacings have a higher revision rate than standard hip replacements in the same age group. And the metal on metal was developed 50 years ago as a resurfacing, but it fell out of favor when polyethylene came about. And the modern resurfacing allows one to do high impact type sports. And that's why we reserve it for these young males. So the, so the Birmingham hip resurfacing is good for, um, for the young male. One of the other companies, Depew, wanted to get on the bandwagon to produce one of these, but had a disaster because their, their material they used was a total disaster. Their tolerances were too tight. Patients got all this inflammation in the hip and they all had to be pulled out. So that's why it went out of favor. And you can see how the numbers in females are close to zero and in males have plateaued. Here you can see the difference between a male and a female. A female has a much higher revision rate. That's why we reserve male resurfacings to young athletic type patients. This was a, a photograph that Andy Murray posted on the internet that caused a lot of uh, <laughs> consternation. As you can see, he was saying, I'm lying in hospital, I've had my hip resurfacing, didn't realize he was sending his whole pelvic x-ray with all these anatomy on show. Now, we, we have changed practice based on evidence. And we know that if you're over 75, your hip's going to last a lifetime. Uh, and you, we just use a standard metal on polyethylene bearing. Males under 55 or females under 55 generally get a ceramic on ceramic bearing because we think it'll last them, life, last them longer. But ceramic on ceramic can squeak. So that's the only downside. The resurfacings are in the young active male only, not in the females. What about approaches? So you've heard all about approaches. Some go anterior, some go posterior. All approaches work. There's no approach that does not work. It's about, is the surgeon uh, comfortable in doing that approach? So there's no published long-term data that supports one approach over the other. So the anterior approach, which is my favorite approach, you can see it goes between muscles and that's why they recover a little bit quicker. But here's the latest data from the joint registry looking at all approaches. There's no difference in outcomes. And I do most of them through the anterior approach because it's purely for short-term gain. No hip precautions can afford a quicker recovery. Patients can drive at seven to 10 days and may reduce the dislocation rate. But as I said at the bottom, a good surgeon will do a perfectly good operation no matter what approach. When we look at the knee side, half knee replacements on the left, full knee on the right. Half knee replacements probably in about 6% of all knees now that are done. But there is a higher revision rate in half knees in the younger patients. So you can see in the under 55, they're better off having a full knee. In fact, they're better off not having a knee replacement at all at that age. But the half knee is doing incredibly well in the older 75 year old when it's isolated medial compartment arthritis. Much quicker recovery, easier to get going. Here's the total knee story, the revision rate at 19 years, 9%.
this is an important um, graph that I show my young patients who think they should have their knees replaced. But you can see if you're under 55 at 19 years, 20% have needed a revision. And if you go back in, every time you go back in, it's never as good as the first time. So I always try, I show this graph to the young patients and say, look, you've got to hang on to your current knee for as long as possible. All this technology, computer navigation, there's really no real difference, except in the young patient, it may improve outcomes. The uh, how long things will last, there's no, and how many revisions can I have? There's no real limit. It really depends on the bone quality and what the problem is. So revision outcomes, as I said, are never as good as the first time round, but a patient may have multiple revisions for a certain problem. But you can see a patient who's had a revision hip 15 years later has a 25% chance of needing a new a second revision, as opposed to if they had a primary hip at 15 years, only 8% would have needed a revision. So when you go in again, the revision rate is higher. So we have all sorts of technology. You may have heard of robotic knees, but a robot is actually, all it's doing is it's helping the surgeon hold the saw. It's actually not doing the operation. So that's, it's, it's really a surgical assistant. What you'll see coming through your practices is probably more patients who have been sent home as opposed to going to rehab. And there's no evidence for the majority of patients that inpatient rehab makes a difference. They certainly need some exercises and physio, but probably 60 to 70% of patients can go home. A lot of people feel they're gonna get an inferior result if they go home, but this is not true. Patients who have comorbidities and elder patients clearly need to go to inpatient rehab. But this rapid recovery protocol allows patients to get home. Issues that you may face are pain management issues, wound complications, deep vein thrombosis, or sudden deterioration. And my advice is if you see a patient who suddenly deteriorates, send them straight to hospital. But as for the pain management, wound complications, we'll go through this now. The trend is to reduce the dependency on opioids. Um, depression obviously influences pain, so depressed patients do worse. We try and steer to the Plexia instead of the Endone uh, and Targen. Um, obviously, the other medications like Panadol, Panadine, Fort, etc. Hips are always less uh, painful than knees. Try and institute a regime of oral analgesics to include both slow release and quick release. The slow release gives you this background um, sort of maintenance. Paracetamol, we all know, is a drug that uh, shouldn't be maxed out because of the issues of the liver. You can add them with codeine. Um, interesting, you know, panadine extra, uh, as opposed to panadine fort, there's no real difference between the two. Uh, and so in terms of their analgesics effect, so we tend to give more panadine extra, which has got 15 milligrams of codeine, as opposed to 30 milligrams in panadine fort, because there's lower constipation with panadine extra. Uh, oxycodone, you know, with endone, uh, obviously these are the dependency drugs that we're trying to get away from. Uh, Targen is the slow release one. Tremel is a drug that is less effective on the bowel uh, than the morphine derivatives. Uh, but the downside is that one in three seem to get nausea. Pelexia is a drug we're using quite a bit now, which has similar uh, opioid effects uh, similar analgesic effects, but a lower in incidence of side effects. Um, like Trammel, uh, Palexia decreases the seizure threshold, so you need to be careful when using these people uh, in epileptics. Um, these drugs obviously should be used with caution in patients who are uh, heavy drinkers as well. How long do you have to keep taking Targen and Endone? Well, we try and get them off within eight weeks, uh, otherwise they do become uh, dependent. And there is this uh, condition called the serotonin syndrome. Uh, so patients who are on antidepressants who in combination with a Trammel um, and Tepentadol, Palexia may get the serotonin syndrome, which results in rising temperatures and can become quite serious. Uh, there are these mo modifying agents like pregabalin, like, which is Lyrica or the old one gabapentin. And we use uh, Lyrica not infrequently initially uh, but that's another way you can use uh, for pain management. And ice and heat uh, to help with uh, pain relief. Ice initially in the first two weeks and then heat thereafter. 
wound complications. If you uh, see patients with oozy wounds, you do need to change the dressing. Uh, any concerns, inspect the wound. We like to try and keep dressings on for two weeks uh, and not disturb them unless they're leaking. Deep vein thrombosis. There's a huge trial that's happened in Australia, which will come out either in favor of aspirin as opposed to clexane or vice versa. And we'll know the results in about uh, two months time. But most patients uh, for prophylaxis need 100 milligrams of aspirin uh, a day for uh, a hip for a month or a knee for two weeks, or alternatively, Clexane or alternatively, Xarelto. We don't do routine Dopplers unless the patient has a clinical sign for it. So if it's clinically indicated, uh, then do a Doppler, but no routine Dopplers. And the treatment, if it's a minor calf vein thrombosis, uh, then they can get aspirin or Clexane or Xarelto, and then you rescan them in two weeks. But if it's an above knee thrombosis, then they need full anticoagulation. Follow up with the joint every 10 years, and you can see this is a loose hip replacement. You can see these lines here, and the same with the knee. So that's why follow up every 10 years is important uh, for, uh, for joint replacements. And the first and final words, as I said, as I get back to you, is the, um, is the uh, choosing the surgeon. Now, I am gonna give you two seconds because I just realized I, have opened the, the wrong, I'm just going to bring up, uh, apologies, I'll just bring that back up. Um, but I, I, I want to make a, uh, I want to make a comment on, um, uh, on, on hospitals. And I did have a slide on this, but one of the, there is a, a big push now to try and get patients into smaller hospitals to have their joint replacements. And these smaller hospitals are owned by health funds. And they're enticing surgeons to come to these hospitals uh, to, uh, with increased payments effectively. And the enticement for the patients is that everything's for free effectively. There's no out of pocket, but patients are being kicked out of those hospitals and going home. There's no option to go to rehab and that the, um, the outcome is dictated upon effectively by the health fund and the hospital. They, they are cherry picking because what's happening is people with comorbidities cannot get into these smaller hospitals because they are not uh, appropriate for them. You have to leave hospital in two or three days. And that's why a hospital like Prince of Wales Private, to me, is absolutely critical for a joint replacement because it offers every single facility that one needs. Patients get heart problems. Patients get respiratory problems. Patients are not forced out of hospital in, uh, in a matter of two or three days because of the pressure that the health funds are putting onto them. So this trend, which started in the USA is actually a dangerous thing that's coming here. It started in the USA because in the USA, what happened is that the surgeons wanted to own the bundle. Whereas in Australia, it's a very different story. The surgeons don't own the bundle. This is about the health funds trying to direct the care uh, the way they want to. But I'll finish there. I think my time is definitely up and I am open to questions. Okay, here's a question. How common is heparin-induced thrombocytopenia after knee replacement? Very rare. Um, so generally we use Clexane, we don't use heparin, uh, and I can't recall the last time I saw it. Does prolia have a role in promoting good bone health post-total hip replacement? Um, frankly, it doesn't matter whether the patient is, from a joint replacement point of view, whether the patient is on prolia or not. Uh, if the patient's bone is soft, we glue it in. And if the patient's bone is robust, they might still have an uncemented uh, implant. So I wouldn't change your prolia regime. Uh, it doesn't matter. They shouldn't, patients shouldn't, should be put on prolia if they need it from an osteoporotic point of view, not from their joint replacement point of view. We have another question. Meniscus tear and operations to remove. Is that a good idea? Because I heard that will shorten the period of needing yeah. knee so, replacements in the future. So the, the, um, somebody who has a torn meniscus, once you remove the meniscus, that knee will gradually develop osteoarthritis. That is a fact. But often if the knee is locked, you have to remove the meniscus. We generally don't operate on meniscal tears when patients are over the age of 55 or 60 because there's no advantage whatsoever. Um, can you please elaborate on indications for half knee replacements rather than total? 
Uh, good question. So the indications for a half knee replacement is when you have a uh, when you have a isolated medial compartment arthritic joint. So if the if the if the medial compartment is arthritic or only the lateral compartment is arthritic, then a partial knee replacement is indicated because the recovery is quicker and it just allows an easier option, so to speak. But most knees have the medial and patellofemoral compartment that are worn out and therefore are not suitable for a half knee. So I just, I've, I finally found the slide I was looking for, um, which is intuitive to everybody. I mean, you all know uh, that, um, that uh, Prince of Wales has, um, Pr Prince of Wales Private has a comprehensive multidisciplinary care, which is critical for joint replacements, ICU backup, HDU cardiology, rapid on-site response team. We care for all patients, no matter what their comorbidity. So patients are not excluded, unlike when they go to these smaller hospitals, which are cherry picking only the healthy ones. And there's no pressure to send patients home in two to three days, uh, as some of the other hospitals are doing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Solomon. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Raj Anand. He is a consultant physician in general medicine, rheumatology and pain medicine, and will be speaking on inflammatory arthritis, diagnostic tips and pitfalls. Thank you, Dr. Anand. Good evening, everyone. I hope you can see my slide. Susan, can you? You can see my Yes, yes we can. Yeah, Thank perfect. You. Thank you so much. Um, just thought I'll thank you, Dr. Solomon, for the wonderful talk. Uh, it was very interesting to hear about joint replacements. I'm going to take a little bit of a turn into inflammatory arthritis, uh, diagnostic tips and pitfalls, largely a lot about what I learned uh, during my whole career as a rheumatologist and a little bit later as a pain specialist. And I acknowledge the traditional custodians of the country throughout Australia and recognize the continuing connection to land, water, and community. I pay my respects to them and their culture and to the elders, both past and present. And I work at different uh, hospitals, uh, Eastern Suburbs Pain Clinic, which I work from the Prince of Wales Private Hospital. No specific uh, disclosures or conflicts to declare based on the stock. And coming back to some of the things I would like to share, probably in a form of a a uh, case okay, story, a patient uh, who I saw very early in my training, uh, but something uh, which taught a lot about how to do assessments, investigations, and treatment of people with inflammatory arthritis. I'll use that as a case example and uh, kind of talk through how I would be kind of assessing someone with uh, arthritis. And uh, as with many stories, once upon a time, uh, a long time ago, uh, when telephones looked uh, very different, I got a call, I uh, was from a GP and uh, uh, was about a patient and he briefly told me that uh, he, uh, this patient had gout and uh, what should he do next? Um, luckily that afternoon, uh, I had a space in the clinic. I said, do you wanna send him over? And uh, probably I would like to consider doing a joint aspirate. And, um, and a few hours later, uh, Pat arrived and uh, Pat was uh, a plumber and um, he was in his 40s, uh, fit and healthy until the last uh, few weeks uh, when he developed pain in his uh, right foot. Uh, initially, didn't take much notice of it, uh, noticed he was hobbling, so take a, took a few pills from uh, what he found in his cabinet. Uh, and then kind of uh, felt a bit better. He went back to work. And then a few weeks later, uh, again, developed uh, ankle pain. And this time took a few more medications. So I went back to his doctor, he took a few more stronger pain medications and uh, some more still, and the pain was not getting any better. Uh, this is when uh, he kind of, uh, his GP kind of rung me to see what we should do. Uh, just a slide of interruption, I mean, uh, just about how soon specialists interrupt uh, their patients. Uh, and uh, they say about 28 seconds in Slovenia. This is, this is all data 
I, I think hopefully things have improved and the lengthy monologues uh, in specialist settings. I try to aim to keep it as long as possible, sometimes even up to five minutes, but I do have the luxury of time. And uh, coming back to Pat, I uh, started asking uh, about what was happening and uh, just to kind of see if there was any trauma. So someone who's coming with a swollen joint, the first thing uh, we try to look at is, is there any trauma? Was there any incident that could have led to it? Uh, and uh, is there any symptoms of morning stiffness, uh, particularly more in the context of uh, inflammatory arthropathy? Um, people with osteoarthritis can have morning stiffness, uh, but usually lasting less than 30 minutes, uh, whereas with inflammatory arthritis, it can be more prolonged. Uh, and usually people feel better once they move much better during the day. And sometimes uh, things again kind of get a bit worse towards the end of the day. Ask for any history of psoriasis, if you had any skin rash, uh, especially with monoarticular joints, uh, could this be a seronegative arthritis? Um, the other question was, is there any history of inflammatory bowel disease? Uh, we do know uh, people with uh, Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis can present uh, with seronegative type arthritis are also looking for any history of celiac disease where occasionally people can present with arthralgia, uh, none of which she had. The other questions we screen for is any infectious component. Uh, was there any, again, going back to trauma or was there any reason why this person could have had infection, whether that was a streptococcal um, or a tubercular, again, that's very rare, or looking for other uh, infectious causes in recent times. Uh, and uh, definitely looking for um, for things like chlamydia or gonococcal, uh, where they can have arthritis or even viruses uh, sometimes again becomes an important part. Uh, also, we ask a few more questions about uh, connective tissue uh, disorders, particularly keeping in mind things like uh, lupus or Sjogren's or scleroderma. Again, much less likely in this in a 47-year-old male. Um, again, uh, it's important to ask if there is any rash. Could this be a manifestation of uh, an underlying autoimmune condition? Family history, again, becomes important. Looking for both inflammatory arthritis, uh, psoriasis, or uh, looking for any history of ankylizing spondylitis, inflammatory spondylar arthropathy, all of which can present as uh, monoarticular or polyarticular inflammatory arthritis. Malignancy, again, uh, so often uh, during my practice, you don't see it often, but uh, every now and then you meet a person who presents either with back pain um, more commonly and uh, on further imaging, uh, it ends up being either a metastatic disease or multiple myeloma. I uh, still remember a patient who had ankylizing spondylitis for nearly 50 years and uh, had a worsening of her back pain and uh, was assumed it was a flare-up of her ankle spawn. And uh, nearly after six months, uh, when we redid her imaging, uh, a CT scan showed multiple crushed fractures and she actually had multiple myeloma. So again, looking and thinking back, could this be... Uh, a malignancy is something uh, which is important. And in Pat's case, uh, uh, when we did ask uh, about malignancy, he said, yes, uh, he did have a past history uh, of uh, a transitional cell carcinoma in situ of his bladder and 10 years ago and had uh, intravesical therapy with BCG. And uh, this was repeated about six weeks ago and he had felt uh, reasonably well uh, in his symptoms. And there's always um, pain and the impact pain can have uh, on their life. Um, as a rheumatologist, um, uh, sometimes we try to focus a bit more on the biomedical aspects. Uh, as I've transitioned more into pain medicine, uh, definitely looking into the wider aspects of pain uh, become much more important. And how can we optimize some of these factors? How can we prevent them uh, from developing more interference due to pain? And uh, sometimes even asking, can we prevent uh, chronic pain? Uh, a lot of uh, um, studies are still needed, uh, but it's very important to realize that there are many more predisposing factors, irrespective of what 
the acute pathology is. Um, and uh, coming to Pat, um, he was, uh, um, I mean, we did, I didn't explore any at that stage, uh, but some of the things if he had come today was not necessarily about for every patient, but definitely keeping an eye on to what is their development history, what are the things that are happening in their life, both in the present and past, can be helpful uh, in kind of directing uh, the treatments, uh, looking into what meaning this pain means to them, uh, whether it's uh, the inability of Pat uh, to go to work, uh, the, the need to take some assistance uh, from his family, uh, the inability to play with his children, his future commitments, and even words like osteoarthritis or degenerative arthritis uh, can create a lot of fear or a lot of impressions on people and that can kind of affect uh, compliance or even the treatment choices uh, they make uh, or some of the images they have uh, very commonly bone on bone. Uh, emotions, is, uh, feelings, emotions, and moods are very important. And again, uh, depression or anxiety needs to be addressed. Not that uh, depression or anxiety leads to inflammatory arthritis, uh, but again, becomes helpful in managing um, the person's overall well-being and looking into how uh, these symptoms affect their whole life uh, becomes an important part. Coming back uh, to Pat's case, um, he did an examination, normally looking for gait, examining all the joints and looking for signs of inflammation, which can be uh, in the form of swelling or uh, looking for tenderness or uh, also called this allodynia, where uh, normal sensations like pressure on a joint, which should not be causing pain, is it causing pain? And again, there could be many factors why one can feel uh, pain in a joint. And uh, the biggest question is how much of it is uh, due to a nociceptive pathway where uh, is there an increased uh, production of inflammatory cytokines or is there some sort of activation of the nociceptors uh, which could be leading to pain or is it more a dysfunction of the pain processing systems uh, which is more a nociplastic type of a mechanism or very rarely a neuropathic if there is direct inflammation or pressure on a nerve root. Um, in examination, in fact, uh, we did uh, see though his, most of his pain was in his ankle. Uh, his knees were a bit swollen and uh, he did have swelling of his toes, uh, dactylitis. So again, that gave a bit of an indication it's much more than probably a crystal related arthropathy, probably a more systemic uh, phenomena. Though gout can be a great mimicker of uh, different inflammatory arthritis. And sometimes again, the pattern of the joints involved can be very helpful in identifying what type of inflammatory arthritis this person could be presenting with. Uh, usually with rheumatoid, it's the small joints, the hands and the feet, the more symmetrical uh, compared to um, psoriatic arthritis, which can be present in many ways. It can be again a mimicker like rheumatoid affecting small joints, or it could be isolated or oligoarthritis, mainly of the large joints. Uh, it can also present as uh, uh, spondyloarthropathies, more with sacroilitis and back pain, or with dactylitis and nail changes. So psoriatic arthritis can present in many ways, and osteoarthritis again um, presents, uh, whether it's the hips, the knees, or the small joints of our hands. Uh, usually, I mean, one of the differentiator, not always. Uh, perfect is uh, the DIP joints are not so commonly involved in rheumatoid arthritis, uh, whereas in psoriatic arthritis and osteoarthritis, uh, they can be involvement of the DIP. Uh, the knuckles are less likely involved in osteoarthritis, the most common joints, particularly of the hands in osteoarthritis or the first CMC joint and the first MCP joint are very common place. And many times uh, you may be able to visualize uh, bony osteophytes, uh, which again can be helpful. Coming, running back into what sort of diagnostic tests, which could be helpful, um, or coming back, uh, a, a part of the diagnostic depends on the differential apologies for the extremely small print. Uh, this was just uh, a slide I copied from 
uh, the internet. Uh, again, saying that there are many causes when someone presents uh, with a swollen, painful joint. Uh, it could be of many types in some of the things what we talked about. Is it infectious? Is it an inflammatory and autoimmune, which kind of falls under the rheumatoid group? Or is it seronegative, where the blood tests are negative? Uh, or is it a connective tissue disorder leading to an inflammatory arthropathy? Is it vasculitic? Is it osteoarthritis? Uh, or is it a secondary phenomena to uh, another systemic condition, such as diabetes, thyroid, uh, hemochromatosis, or a malignancy, um, and looking for other uh, causes, in, including uh, um, uh, chronic widespread pain can quite often present with widespread joint pains. Uh, and that can help us direct, uh, depending on what uh, we are, what is running in our differential, uh, we can run investigations accordingly. Uh, some of the common investigations, I mean, in fact, I'm um, just reading through, uh, we had a high CRP of 224, uh, important to get. An inflammatory marker can be helpful, though uh, it may not necessarily differentiate between an infectious or an inflammatory, uh, that could be helpful. Uh, we did get a urate level, uh, it was 0 0.36. Um, the normal target, um, 0.36, sometimes if you look into the lab forms, can come as the normal range. Just looking at a single value of urate, uh, it's very hard uh, or near impossible to exclude or uh, rule in gout because gout attacks basically happens when there is increase in the urate level or a drop in the urate level. Quite often when we see people, we start them um, in, in people with gout, when we start them on ilipurinol, uh, that kind of leads to a drop in the urate level and that can precipitate a gout attack. And um, uh, or many times they once again stop taking their medication and that can push the urate level up and lead to another gout attack. So again, explaining uh, this to uh, the patients definitely helps in improving compliance, but not stopping allopurinol once you stop it, unless there is uh, a different reason, like if there is a side effect or a skin rash, uh, trying to maintain compliance helps and also looking into some sort of a prophylactic medication, whether that's in the form of colchicine or an anti-inflammatory, uh, rarely prednisone could be options. Um, and um, we, and usually if you're thinking about an inflammatory arthropathy, uh, it's worthwhile getting a rheumatoid factor and anti-CCP. This can act as a prognostic uh, factor. Um, in, her, in Pat's case, they were both normal. Uh, and again, anti-CCP has been quite helpful to look into the long-term prognosis and also can help in deciding about treatment. Just once again, uh, a positive rheumatoid factor or a positive anti-CCP does not mean that uh, they have an inflammatory arthritis. Uh, it increases their risk that they may develop one in the future and there's no reason for doing any prophylactic medical therapy or medications uh, in those patients. Probably the key thing I would say is stop smoking or don't take up smoking. Uh, ANA in her most negative anti-nuclear antibodies. And usually if they are negative, we don't need to go on and do the whole panel, which may include the double strand DNA. Uh, specifically, that's more if you're thinking of lupus or an extractable nuclear antigen or ENA, looking into are there other patterns uh, which could be suggestive of other autoimmune or connective tissue diseases. Uh, also, some other tests which are helpful um, and which are standard practice is hematology, getting the full blood count, uh, looking into renal, liver, thyroid function, um, looking into ferritin, calcium, magnesium, phosphate. Vital serology can be helpful, more in acute cases, um, to kind of see if there is a diagnostic thing. Uh, mainly the Ross v River virus or uh, the Barnum Forest virus, the EBV parvo are common causes. Hepatitis B and C, again, the rare can sometimes be helpful in, in future if you ever decide to start immunomodulatory therapy, particularly biologics. These tests are more helpful and definitely uh, if you're looking at TNF, we do get a uh, tuberculosis screen, either with serum quantiferon plus minus imaging. Uh, streptococcal titus, uh, and radiology, again, is uh, very helpful. Uh, with Pat, uh, at that time, we uh, started off doing a plain x-ray, which uh, was normal. This is not his x-ray. Uh, but again, um, 
many times uh, we start off either with plain x-rays to see if there's any pre-existing erosions or changes. Uh, and our next speaker will be talking about uh, uh, radiology in detail. Um, there's definitely a role of either getting an ultrasound uh, to see if there's an effusion, sometimes how it can help us in aspirate um, and, um, or some getting MRI, uh, looking for any evidence of synovitis and bone edema, uh, which again become very helpful, particularly in directing treatment. Uh, the gold standard still, especially if, um, the question of gout is being raised or even with inflammatory arthritis, uh, aspiration can still be very helpful. Um, and um, we, uh, with Pat, uh, we did aspirate his uh, ankle um, and uh, that showed more a bloodstained fluid and we couldn't analyze it. There was no crystals. So I think uh, the following day or two, he'd still had a swollen knee. So we did a knee aspirate in the rooms uh, and which did show uh, once again, um, a high, uh, a moderate to high level white cell count suggesting more of an inflammatory picture uh, with about 3,500 white cells, um, sorry, 20,000 white cells and uh, 3,500 were neutrophils. Uh, there was again, no crystals. So again, making the possibility of gout much less likely. So uh, the joint fluid can be helpful in this case it's kind of uh, tending to point us more towards looking into a more inflammatory uh, pathology. At this point, I was uh, but wondering what was uh, going on. And this is something which happens quite often. Uh, do we look for a diagnostic trial or what do we do? And in that case, we call it an undifferentiated inflammatory arthritis. I'm saying, I don't know what it is and we'll take a surveillance approach. Um, and kind of look back a little bit into what symptoms he had uh, and uh, speaking to him uh, a bit more, we kind of, um, and, and then kind of the diagnosis was reactive arthritis to BCG, going uh, back a little bit into his history, the symptoms had begun uh, about when he was in the second week of this BCG therapy, uh, which kind of settled the first time, uh, but the symptoms kept recurring as he had more cycles. And uh, coming back to one of the more common treatments, um, I do remember Pat's case was many years ago. And at that time, what's the best treatment? And uh, we definitely did choose um, steroid. And uh, some of the literature before the, the uh, discovery of uh, prednisone or steroid, um, rheumatoid arthritis was a very hard, or inflammatory arthritis was a very crippling disease to treat. Uh, and uh, it was in the 1950s uh, when prednisone uh, was, steroids were kind of discovered and that led to uh, a widespread use. And then came the biggest issue of how much and uh, definitely uh, I prefer using very small doses, normally start with somewhere between 10 milligrams and if needed go up to 20 or if they're younger even start early. Uh, there, there are many times uh, this, um, where we try to see whether we can even avoid uh, the use of prednisone uh, and uh, both as a diagnostic purpose or even as a treatment as there are many pitfalls and uh, the evidence. Uh, we definitely have a lot of evidence uh, where there are more serious problems with prednisone, particularly as the higher doses go up. And uh, though uh, there is hugely a large talk about five milligram is much more safer, uh, five or 10 milligrams, some more recently people are talking, uh, should we be aiming for zero milligrams in most people? And uh, if people have been on higher doses, uh, looking for uh, a taper down uh, of the steroid doses, uh, if they're on a short course, you can do it 10 to 20 percent every few weeks, or uh, if they have been on it for long term, uh, one might still have to see whether we can bring them to and change over to something like hydrocortisone. If they are on prednisone, definitely think about osteoporosis prophylaxis. Um, with Pat's case, Pat felt uh, very happy when we first put him on prednisone, uh, but uh, within uh, once we started the taper down, he uh, started developing his pains again. Uh, and uh, then we decided to uh, look at uh, some of the disease modifying agents. Um, the, the commonly used ones at the top for um, methotrexate still being the gold standard. Uh, we did try methotrexate and leflunamide, and uh, 
at that stage, I think, uh, moved to different hospitals now. Um, they were at that stage, uh, he was still not under optimal control and they were looking into the next steps, uh, which was the biologics and uh, whether to use uh, a TNF agent. Uh, there, are many, there are many agent um, biologics available. Uh, the list is not complete here, uh, uh, and including the jack honeys and inhibitors, which are more popular. And um, again, from uh, a GP practice point of view, there are many things we would uh, monitor. The main things is the signs of infection, uh, looking to their liver functions, uh, and uh, looking for certain things, looking into their lipid profiles. Uh, risk of infection, again, is extremely, uh, is higher, uh, but again, depends on the patient's comorbidities, if they're a smoker, uh, high BMI, and um, a prednisone is also noted to be a high culprit, particularly at high doses, is much worse uh, than methotrexate. The risk of infection, actually, with methotrexate uh, is about 1.1, so which is pretty low, and sometimes having an inflammatory arthritis itself increases our risk. Uh, monitoring liver functions become important, particularly the alcohol use, looking at the blood counts, uh, pregnancy, uh, there are lots of contraindications, particularly if they're on drugs like methotrexate or leflunamide, the TNF uh, inhibitors are definitely found to be more safer, uh, but again, would uh, have further discussion with their rheumatologist. Uh, vaccinations uh, is definitely something very important, particularly as we are starting up with uh, the general COVID vaccinations. Uh, definitely not a contraindication, and we have strong data from that from uh, across Europe and uh, America. Uh, we would recommend all our rheumatology patients to get vaccinated. Ideally, it would be before they start an immunomodulator, if there ever is an opportunity, that's the best time because these medications can slightly reduce their ability to develop a fully formed response, uh, looking out for malignancy, more in the form of skin cancers, uh, cardiovascular risks, again, more from an inflammatory arthritis point of view. Uh, smoking is a big issue and definitely recommend people to strongly stop smoking. Um, in the past, uh, this was an MH, uh, but we hope that with uh, future treatment and getting people treated very early, uh, usually, uh, and even in, within a few weeks, uh, can have better prognosis. So the whole drive is towards treating people towards a target. Uh, DAS-28 is one rheumatoid, uh, calculated the different calculators, and also very importantly, looking at the whole person and to their needs still becomes a very important uh, treatment in their whole journey, particularly uh, many of these, uh, we do not have a cure. Um, and uh, I think I will stop there. Uh, I think uh, managing pain again becomes an important part and unfortunately pain though is a very important part of the disease monitoring system. Many times uh, pain is a big uh, diagnostic pitfall or even a treatment pitfall because uh, pain can be due to many, uh, many causes and many times may not always be a direct, um, directly correlate with how much inflammation or inflammatory changes are happening within a joint. So uh, once again, looking at the whole person uh, can be very important in the treatment journey. Okay, we have one question at the yes, moment. Sir. Everyone can please keep putting them in. Uh, what medication would you prescribe for inflammation other than prednisone? Um, I mean, the, the key thing, I mean, we still do use prednisone again, trying to see whether we can get with uh, uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. The other uh, option could be uh, sometimes if there is um, an active rheumatoid arthritis, we've confirmed the diagnosis, do we go straight to using an immunomodulator, such as methotrexate, without even starting them on prednisone, or could be, uh, is also uh, an option. And uh, there's no definite, uh, there's no, um, between the anti-inflammatories, uh, there's no one anti-inflammatory, which is more superior to others. Everything has their pros and cons. Uh, and each person suits better to one, particularly when used in the long term. The next question is, any long-term side effects of TNF? Um, with TNF, there's been long-term data coming up for up to 20 years. There's uh, no uh, long-term organ-related side effects that we are worried about. Uh, the main things is about disease control and remission. There are studies coming up in once they are in remission, can we reduce or can we uh, increase the duration between the biologics? 
uh, between the TNFs and can we even stop them? Uh, we do kind of, I mean, there are a lot of registries once again, looking into malignancy data. There are uh, no increases apart from skin cancers. So again, those are uh, precautions we would definitely ask them to look at. Uh, infection risk is another thing which does continue along. So that's something uh, which we have to manage and it's a bit of balance between uh, disease activity and uh, the medication risk. Uh, I can also see another question on how long can methotrexate be taken? Uh, there is no time period on how long. Uh, I've had a lot of patients in their 80s and they are going into their 90s still on methotrexate. And um, the question is about what, based on what it is doing, if they are in remission, can we slowly wean it down and see how they respond? Uh, or if they're tolerating well with no specific side effects, we do leave them on the methotrexate. A large part depends on what's the disease activity of the inflammatory arthritis. Uh, the next question is how often methotrexate should be reviewed? Uh, I would say depending upon how much they're in remission, normally uh, in the in the very start, I would say every four to six weeks, I would do a blood test once stabilized. Every three months, uh, there's some uh, patients who I follow every six months to yearly uh, if things are going stable. Uh, so uh, I think it just depends upon their disease activity. Um, we this no uh, normally I would recommend at least a yearly uh, blood test and uh, six monthly review by the GP. Uh, we would definitely avoid live uh, vaccines uh, with TNF drugs uh, because that can uh, uh, kind of uh, it's, uh, we do not recommend live vaccines. And what is the role of colchicine? Yes. Um, <laughs> definitely uh, colchicine is something which I have uh, used. I mean, people have looked at it in inflammatory osteoarthritis, um, but it is not, uh, trials have not shown it to be effective. Um, and uh, colchicine can, and some people have used, but I should say uh, it works great in gout, unfortunately doesn't work so well in people with uh, either rheumatoid or uh, even an inflammatory osteoarthritis don't find it that effective. That's more from personal experience and there's no data again to support its use too. Okay, I think we'll leave it there. Thank you very much, Dr. Anand, that was great. So now we will introduce Dr. Sarah Morris. She's a radiologist and will be speaking on approach to lower limb imaging. Dr. Anand, if you're still there while Dr. Morris is sorting her screen out, there was one other question. Yep. Uh, Once there is improvements with mesotrexate, why? the doctor tends to further increase the dose. Why is that? Uh, largely, uh, it's mainly to get uh, disease activity under control. So there may be uh, some swollen joints. Or, uh, the aim is to see whether we can get it into full remission. That's one of the main reasons why we try to get to a target dose of uh, the methotrexate, whether it's 10 or 20 milligrams, uh, largely uh, to see if there's any other, even though the patient feels better, there still might be evidence of uh, inflammation. Thank you, Dr. Anand. Uh, now we've got Dr. Sarah Morris, um, who will be talking about the approach to lower limb imaging. Thank you, Dr. Morris. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to talk about lower limb imaging um, primarily aiming it at the primary care physicians. Um, I'm just going to try and give an overview of um, the modalities, review the imaging the modalities and how, how we use them and how they can help you. Principles of imaging haven't really changed um, over time. There are a few newer options available. Um, there are th some things we do better now than we used to do. Um, and one thing I just would like to say, and I think this applies more to musculoskeletal imaging than to um, some of the other imaging, is that the clinical assessment is critical, not obviously just to you, but even more so to us, um, because there's so much wear and tear in the body, there's so much, so many changes we often see, and um, we don't necessarily know if they're significant or not, and sometimes the clinical information you give us will sway um, how much we talk about something, how much emphasis we put on a possible abnormality um, or how much um, in additional investigations we would recommend. 
So I'm just going to go through and review the basics. Uh, most of the principles I'll be talking about apply both to upper limb and lower limb, um, but most of the examples I will give are lower limb um, in this instance. Um, yeah, just talk about which modalities would might help you in certain scenarios and um, take it from there. So. So the options, as you will all be aware, are X-ray, MRI, CT, ultrasound. Um, also going to comment briefly on bone scan and dual energy CT because you um, use them, sure, I'm sure, a little bit as well. And um, the option of injections and aspirations has already been mentioned um, by earlier speakers. Um, there's some basic principles. I think X-ray, there's very few occasions where X-ray is not going to help you. Ultrasound, just keep in mind that it's really good for the superficial soft tissues, but really only for the superficial soft tissues. But it has other advantages, um, especially that it can localize symptoms. We can correlate between their symptoms and specific anatomical sites. Um, we can use dynamic imaging. So we can look um, when there's a possible tear in a tendon. Sometimes we can confirm that more clearly on ultrasound than on MRI because we can actually move the tendon and sometimes that will make the tendon, a tear in the tendon open up better and we can be more definitive about it. Um, and so we're less, we're less um, restrained by partial volumeing that we get in MRI um, and um, so that could be very advantageous. Um, obviously, ultrasound can also be used to guide um, for injections and for aspirations, um, particularly in, in patients where it's difficult to clinically um, aspirate fluid, um, or in the patients where the um, you know the joints are very degenerative and it's very hard clinically again to be sure you, you, where you're putting the uh, medication. Um, CT, I think CT sometimes is overutilized um, and I really advocate CT is best for a targeted review. So if you've got a specific question, a specific point of concern, or you're doing it, it's for a specific purpose, such as fracture characterization. I mean, MRI, I'm sure you're very familiar with MRI. I think it's probably our main tool after X-ray these days. And uh, it's, it's good now that at least some MRIs can be referred by the GPs. Um, and it's really, it's very, it's an invaluable tool for the um, soft tissues. Um, internal soft tissues being in the joints or the deep soft tissues. So in the, the larger patients, even things such as gluteal tendons may be um, better imaged on MRI than ultrasound because the ultrasound depth um, is not, so it cannot get to the um, deeper um, tissues. So basics of X-ray, um, I'm not gonna go read through all of this um, just to, it's there to jog your menu, memory, um, but basically the, there's so many positives about an X-ray. It's so easy to perform, it gives us so much um, background information, which can really change um, how we look at things, or might change emphasis. Again, change the emphasis um, we put on a on an abnormality. You get the background going quality, whether the patient's um, osteopenic. You get the view, review of the alignment. You get soft tissue calcifications, which can be very difficult to pick on MRI and ultrasound. It gives us the overview of the joint status, background arthropathy, which might be there, which might be the clue to you know an, an nodule being a rheumatoid nodule, for example. Um, and I think it's a really good, simple opportunity to pick up a major unexpected finding and cause for symptoms. So we see occasionally patients coming in with, uh, um, with you know, having had a small sports injury with some pain and they've done the x-ray appropriately and there's actually a bone lesion there um, and the patient had a pre-existing bone tumour. And um, if you haven't done the x-ray, it could be, it could be some time till you, missed, um, till you would pick that up. So I just like to say, I don't overlook or um, skip X-ray um, in most circumstances. There may be the very odd occasion, you know, a twisting injury um, in a very healthy patient who had no pre-existing problems where you might think, oh, we just go straight to MRI. But in most cases, I think um, it, it's, it could be a big mistake to skip doing an X-ray. Um, CT, as I briefly mentioned earlier, uh, it's really good for targeted information. If you want to characterize a fracture, if you want to characterize a bone lesion, if you want to assess for focal bone loss, um, such as osteomyelitis, if there's an abnormality on an X-ray where we say, we think there might be this, or we think there might be that, that's a time when CT is very valuable because it will give us that additional um, detail where we can confirm or not um, the questionable X-ray appearance. I've put a cult fracture there because we get referrals for cult fracture a lot, um, but I just like to, um, ask everybody that if you are sending someone from a cold fracture, can you, it, I think it improves the sensitivity of the study significantly. If you let us know um, a bit more clinical information, so one where you think the occult fracture might be or what the mechanism of injury was, because on the CT, although it's, it's great for showing fractures, there's just so much, um, so many bones to look at and so many images, there's thousands of images um, when, you, when you reconstruct it in different planes that if you don't, it's, I think it's actually quite easy to actually miss fractures if you don't know what the concern is. 
Um, then there's other indications for preoperative planning. And I think that's usually um, preferred by the surgeon. And often that's because um, depending what surgery they're, it affects how, what surgery they're doing. And some of the replacements actually need certain um, acquisition, um, has certain specific acquisitions we need to do and data we need to acquire to help them to um, make prostheses. Um, and just also, again, like to preface that it's, it, is a very, it has a very limited role, I believe, in screening for lesions and for fractures, um, because unlike um, MRI or bone scans, it doesn't show inflammation or uh, edema or bone reactive, uh, like osteoblastic activity. It doesn't show, it doesn't have those highlights of, um, th those things which highlight um, our attention uh, to specific uh, points of concern. Um, so please give us the clinical information, I think is the main point with CT. And um, this is just a slide to show you Again, how, how the CT can show significant detail that an X-ray won't. So this is the frontal X-ray, and these are some similar coronal plane slices. And you can see as we, we go through the um, front of the knee, through to the mid to back of the knee, the cortex here looks completely intact. When you come to the back, you can see very nicely there's really a, quite a clear and large fracture. But on the X-ray, it's actually quite subtle. You'd see it on the, on the lateral view probably, um, although it could be obscured because of the other tibial plateau. Um, but just to confirm what we've been saying, that CT gives that extra detail that an X-ray uh, might give or might, um, or gives that extra characterization of a fracture that a C an X-ray might show. Um, this is another example where um, there's a specific uh, reason for the um, CT, which was a patient with um, diabetic uh, foot who's got, had previous episodes of osteomyelitis and has also, and we're looking for um, the, whether their osteomyelitis is active and because these patients often have a lot of um, soft tissue changes um, because they've got inflammation um, around multiple joints. The, you know, the joints are often markedly abnormal as well. It's um, again, very helpful to be told which, if there's like, if it's a diabetic foot, tell us where, where the ulcer is that you're concerned about or which bone it is you're concerned about. Because often these patients, again, would have had previous um, ulcerations and new ulcerations and um, how much we talk about them or, um, how we pick them up um, on CT is quite difficult if we don't know where, you can, of cons where you're concerned about. So this is the soft tissue window of an axi of the through the calcaneus. And you can see normally in the soft tissues next to the bone, there'll be some um, intermediate density and there'll be some fat density, which is this black. But over here where the inflammation is or induration, we can't tell on CT if it's acute or chronic. You can just tell it's not, there's loss of the normal fat. Um, this is where this particular um, concern was. And you can see there's a bone defect here, which once you do the CT images, we can sort of measure how big it is. We can see the margins are quite well defined, which means it's probably partly treated or um, and, and started to heal. Um, but you can see how the DT, CT gives that really fine detail. Well, if you did an X-ray here, you may not see that um, bone destruction at all. And CT in this particular instance would become a very good baseline follow-up because, um, because of the detail gives you the next way to be certain whether there's ongoing osteomyelitis or not would be to do a progress CT and see whether that degree of bone loss has um, increased or whether the degree of bone reaction, which would be a sign of um, healing. So if there's increased sclerosis along here and the lesion, the lysis hasn't increased any further, that would in indicate that it's being treated effectively. Um, MRI, I think you're all very familiar with. Um, it's great for lots of reasons, including that it has no radiation and as we mentioned earlier, it's very good at the soft tissues. But the other thing MRI is very good at, um, which I think it is in, from a problem solving point of view, is it's very good at picking up fractures, not because it can detail the fractures as well as CT can, but because it sees that bone marrow edema in the same way a bone scan does. Um, so it can be a very good problem solver in that point of view. Um, MRI is also very good um, and frequently used for soft tissue characterization um, in terms of a tumor. Um, and also for other occult bone processes. So when, they, when you think someone's got something going on and you're not quite sure, um, it can be used as a, a type of screening tool because it can pick up things such as ABM, it pink, pink, can pick up stress fractures, um, you know, so shin splints, um, metatarsal stress fractures, femoral neck fractures, um, perhaps related to bisphosphonate treatment. Um, any, anywhere where there's early um, bone stress, MRI is very good at picking that up in the same way bone scan is. So that's the other option. Um, and it also, although this is not an is not an advocated um, regular routine use for it, is it you know it's also good for picking up um, small bone lesions. So in meta metastatic disease, sometimes we will pick up that we can see the lesions on the MR earlier than you'll see them on the CT. Um, although we don't use it clinically for that, um, we will like, we can often see them that way. 
Um, MRI has obviously also got, um, well, I'm sure you're all aware that it's used in preoperative assessment, um, particularly for the internal derangement. So in the lower limb for hip um, label tears to look at the cartilage, how much cartilage is, less, is, less, is left on the femoral head. Um, and, but those, I mean, those are usually the referrals that we'll be getting from the um, orthopedic or um, other um, uh, specialist um, referrals. Sorry. So just to show you how the difference is in the, remind you how the difference is and what we can see within a knee joint. So of course the X-ray, if you're just looking at knee joint space and assessing knee joint, the X-ray will show the, um, the, the the width between the cortex and the CT will show a similar thing. The MI, you can actually see the cartilage. So if you look on here, there's a black line here um, with some sort of intermediate signal and then some brighter signal through the middle. The brighter signal in that middle there is the fluid. And then this is cartilage from here to here. This is cartilage from here to here. And then this is that subchondral plate or the, you know, the junction between the cartilage and the cortex again, sorry. Um, so you can see that MRI actually gives very good look at that cartilage as well. And so, you know, when there's a concern about a chondral lesion or an osteochondral uh, fragment somewhere or an unstable osteochondral lesion, such as a Taylor dome lesion in the ankle, um, MRI is a very good tool for, for being able to see those because you can see them directly. Um, it's just showing how, reminding it how the bone scan can be a useful tool because it shows um, information or bone stress. Um, but it doesn't give any of the anatomical detail or um, that we get on um, MRI and CT. This slide I really just put here um, because one thing that MRI does not do well is um, small avulsion fragments or um, chip fragments or loose bodies. So this is just a nice example I think where you can see the bone fragment that's evolved here from the olecranon. And on this particular patient we can actually see there's edema in the olecranon but the bone fragment itself is very difficult to see because the tendon is coming down here and it's black and the bone cortex is black as well, which is probably that little line here. But then the bone that the little bone fragment that you can see on the x-ray um, has got edema in it, which means it's actually bright and very hard to see from the adjacent inflammation. So just um, to remind you that MRI is actually not good for the small, small bone fragments, for avulsion fragments, for tug lesions. MRI is really good for the um, marrow, for the bone injuries where there's been some sort of contusion or compression force. Um, uh, another example, of, uh, another example, just to show some imaging of um, oh, how good MRI can be um, in assessing more complex regions. So this is the typical Liz Frank injury, where this is the base of the first metatarsal and second metatarsal, um, and the middle, uh, sorry, medial middle cuneiform level. And this, we're actually looking here. This, so we've got two types of imaging usually on MRIs. We have these ones where most things are dark, and that's what we call a fat suppressed imaging, and the brightness is um, fluid or edema. And this is the same image, but without that fat suppression. So both fat and, um, and um, edema and fluid are gonna be bright. So this one is very good for us. It's, it's like our bone scan equivalent. It shows us those inflamed areas. And this is very good because it gives us the ligament or tendon detail. So you can actually see here, there's an arrow pointing here at this sort of intermediate signal poorly defined structure here, which is part of the Liz Frank complex. So we can actually directly visualize those Liz Frank ligaments. On top of that, um, even if we hadn't noticed that initially on these images, because it's pretty subtle, we've got these um, bone, uh, the fat suppression images, which have this high signal here in the bones, as well as in the intervals. So we, it draws our attention to the fact that there's um, edema in these metatarsals, there's edema between the metatarsals. So we know that we're looking at a Liz Frank complex type uh, injury here. Um, and the MRI is just good because it, one, it can draw our attention to it. Um, two, it can show us that there's actually some bone injuries there. The detail of those bone injuries you would need to correlate with CT but it can actually also direct those, directly assess those ligaments. So we can see that this part of the Liz Frank ligament is, is sprained and partly torn. This part here is um, mildly sprained, but not torn. And the top part of the Liz Frank ligament is, um, looks to be relatively preserved in this case. Ultrasound um, also has a, a very um, important role in musculoskeletal imaging, um, as long as you, again, are aware of its limitations. So it's very good in superficial soft tissue internal, sorry, superficial soft tissue injury. So things that you can feel clinically or things that you know are just below the surface, we can assess well on ultrasound. Um, same with if there's a, soft, a superficial soft tissue tumor, again, ultrasound can be good for that. Um, it's really good that we can localize the symptoms to the structure. So if the patient is saying they've got this persistent pain here and you just want to know what the pain is coming from, if it's become a you know an ongoing issue and you want to just get that information, is it related to bone? Is there something unexpected there? Is there 
you know, is it a, is it a ligament under there that's maybe a bit stress, strained? Um, we can we can actually localize where their pain is. Um, but a bit like CT, it's or even more than CT, it's most useful when it's targeted. Um, and that's because we only see what we put the probe on. So if we don't, again, know what the clinical question is or where you want us to look at, it's, um, you know, we're, we're not going to look there and therefore we, we're just not going to see those things because it's only, and only, we only, it's a targeted examination. So in terms of lower limb imaging, it's really good for the, at the hip level, it's very good for the gluteal tendons, um, particularly in the slimmer patients. It can be good for hamstring tendons in the slimmer patients. In the larger patients, it can, we can get an overview, but um, our detail is limited um, because it just, the ultrasound can't get through to those deep structures. Popliteal cysts in the knees, it's very helpful for extensive mechanisms and Achilles tendon. Um, just an example to show you, this is a patella tendon. We can see it nicely on the MRI. The high signal is the inflammation. On the ultrasound, you can also see it. You can see all the same characteristics. It's thick at the top, thinner distally. It's altered in its echo texture. So it's a patella tendinopathy. Um, and it's good for that. So I'm just going to run through some quite quickly now some, um, oh, sorry, this is just one more to show you that and another thing that we get referred for um, MRI, sorry, for ultrasound, which is not very um, helpful is we sometimes get ultrasound question mark meniscal tear. And um, it's not helpful um, because we can only see a small amount of the meniscus. So this is like a coronal X-ray, you can, oh, sorry, frontal X-ray. You can see the meniscus here. This is a femoral condyle. This is the tibial condyle. Um, so tibial plateau, and there's a nice triangle there, the meniscus looks normal, but the thing is we can only see part of the meniscus. So this patient meniscus out here looked relatively normal on ultrasound, but it's torn off the um, tibia more centrally, and we just can't see that on ultrasound. So um, just being mindful of uh, one, one example, sorry, where ultrasound can be really good in the knee is just for popliteal cysts. Um, so this patient had medial swelling, um, it's a popliteal cyst, and it's good for knee effusions if you're not sure clinically, maybe in the larger patients. Um, but it's got very limited um, use on the, at the knee level. Just going to run through just some basic um, suggestions on some diagnostic pathways that you might follow in patients who decided knee imaging. Um, so if you've got the older patient with the lower back pain and the hip pain, again, we just start with the x-rays. If you then think that, well, it's more radicular pain, then we're going to be doing an MRI because it's looking at the soft tissues or sometimes a CT because that will show the bony foraminal stenosis or the canal stenosis better. Um, sometimes it can show little synovial cysts with calcium. Um, if you're more worried about the joints and CT would be better for those deep joints, CT can be good because it's, it's not, um, it's not um, easy to see things like facet joints and SI joints on x-rays because of the overlapping structures. If you think more the pain's more lateral problem, we go to ultrasound or possibly MRI. And it, but if the patient's got any sort of unusual features so, or background risk factors for other things, such as stress fractures, or if you think they've got enough, you might actually want to think about doing a progress x-ray if there's been a bit of a time lapse, or um, MRI is really considered the gold standard um, for excluding, particularly even NOFs, um, for excluding any occult fractures. MRI is generally considered the gold standard. Um, a bone scan can also be performed, although obviously it's a, a, a radiation is involved in that. Um, in the younger patient with bone, with the lower back or hip pain, um, we start off the same. We start with um, lumbar sacral spine, we do with hips, more likely to have SI joint heart problems possibly. So that might be what you want to focus on. Um, and then again, if, you, if you think, um, you're think you thinking of some sort of inflammatory arthropathy, you can do an MRI for that or stress injury. So a pedicle, fra a pedicle fracture or pedicle stress from um, too much, you know, bowling and cricket. Um, these patients can, we can, we can do MRI to look for a marrow edema and stress. But it's a different MRI than what we normally do. So it's not the MRI for discs, it's MRI looking for bone stress. And so it's really important that um, we know that's what you're looking for because we do these additional sequences, which are called fat suppressed T2 sequences or STIR sequences, um, where we can we get that edema and that inflammation. Um, and if we don't know that's what we're looking for, then we won't necessarily perform those. So again, just a request that, you know, if, if, if you give us clinical information, it, it can help us do the right studies. Um, or do the studies in a certain way to make sure we get you, um, we have the best chance of getting an answer for you. I'm sure you're all aware that um, FAI of femoral acid tablet impingement um, and MRI is a fairly um, standard uh, investigation for that uh, now. Um, just another note to say, please do give us those, give us that additional information if you're looking for any of these um, conditions which have bone marrow edema or soft tissue inflammation um, and requesting an MRI. 
Um, trauma, I think we've covered a lot of this already, so I'm just going to go through them very quickly. If it's if you think there's a if you do you do your X-ray, if you don't think there's um if you think there's something funny on the X-ray, you might do the CT, or if you think there's a X-ray which uh, a fracture which needs further characterization to like to assess intraticular extent. Um, you, might, you might use the CT for that too. But if you're looking for the cult fracture, these are really what you should be looking for, progress X-ray, MRI or CT. Um, if you're not looking for a fracture, you think it's um, it's not anything significant, um, maybe a small evolution fracture, but nothing that needs treatment, then you might move on to ultrasound or MRI for your next um, imaging. Um, and I've just got a couple of examples, but I don't know if I've got time. Should I keep going? These are just examples to show some images because we send patients around with these long reports. Um, and I was just going to show some images, but I don't need to if you would like me to. We could do, um, we could break do here. maybe one or two. Okay, so I'll just show, this is just an example of the 26-year-old knee um, who had a twisting injury. He had the x-ray um, in emergency, they had an effusion, so they were suspicious of significant injury, but they didn't think he had a fracture. So we went on, they went on and did an MRI. And MRIs, as we said, it's really good for that edema. So these are the fat suppressed sequences. You can see soft tissue inflammation here at the anteromedial aspect of the knee. So that's the medial patellofemoral retinaculum, um, particularly increase of the patella bone here. And there's some more edema in the bone here, which is the anterolateral femur. So history combined with MRI, we know this patient's had a transient patella dislocation. His MPFL has been sprained. His patella bone has come out here and knocked against here and caused a, caused a bone contusion. And we've got the edema there in the patella as well. Um, so MRI is really good at, you know, finding these things and working them out. Another patient, another common one that you see, um, the 13 year old who had a twisting injury. Um, so this is the ACL. So normally there should be a black line going from the back of the femur down to the front of the tibia. Um, and this was an ACL rupture. And the MRI is good in this situation because we can look for the, all the other soft tissue injuries that might occur. So at the front here, this is a frontal view now or a coronal slice. Um, we see a bit of the ACLs being flipped forward. And here we've got on the axial views, we see this funny structure going through here, which there shouldn't be anything going on with that pathway normally. Um, come to that on a bit more on the next slide. But here we see that bone marrow edema again. So you can see some mild, mild brightness here and brightness here. Even before I saw this image, we knew the patient pretty much had an ACL rupture because the femur has come back here as the, as the ACL is broken and hit against the back of the tibia. Um, and it's, it, yeah, we know, we can tell what's happened um, just from this image alone almost. So this is the same patient, um, just showing you what the meniscus looks like. So normally the meniscus, will, this is the medial um, tibia and the medial femur. And there's normally a little triangle here of meniscus at the back and a little triangle here. But this one has two triangles at the front and that's because the meniscus has torn off and flipped over here and that's why and this is it going through here it shouldn't be all the way here it should actually be going around here under the femur um so mri is really nice for that and i hope this just shows you again this is the medial meniscus coming through here there should be an acl coming down here but there's no acl instead we have a pcl and a medial meniscus um, where it should not be um would you like me to stop now i don't think um, we have two questions now yes. um what modality would be useful for suspected gluteal tendopathy? En enthesopathy? Yeah, um, thank you. So in, in the, the, the main, um, an x-ray can be, can be helpful because it can show bony changes um, and bony irregularity, which implies there's been a chronic enthesopathy. The next most common imaging we would do for that is ultrasound. And in pretty much all patients, we can see the gluteal tendons where they insert. But the detail we get depends on the patient, really. If they're a big patient with a lot of adipose tissue over the um, over the hips, over the um, proximal femur, then we get a lim we get limited information. But what we can do with the ultrasound is we can, if there's a big bursal effusion or there's a lot of tenderness, we can comment on that, um, and we can normally get an idea as whether the tendon um, is close to normal or very abnormal. Um, MRI shows it very well, but it's not common that we would do MRI as the first line of, um, of imaging for the, for the tendons. Normally ultrasound plus or minus um, injection, if they think um, like a trial of an injection of the bursa um, is, is what we normally do. The next question is, are there Medicare rebates for specialist orders and MRI for certain parts of the body that GPs can't access? There, there, there is, and it depends on um, a few factors, um, including the sites. So there's certain MRI scanners which have no licenses, which means there's no Medicare on them at all. There's certain MRI scanners that have partial Medicare rebate or partial Medicare licenses, and they 
they, um, the patients who are referred by GP for the items which the GPs can refer for um, can get Medicare rebates on those. But if, you, if a specialist were to refer to those magnets, they, the patients in most situations won't get a rebate, even if the clinical indications are the same. Then there are other license, other MRI scanners which have a full Medicare license and they, ha they have access to um, giving patients rebates for specialist referrals and under specialist criteria as well as the um, GP, GP um, referrals. Does that make sense? Thank you, yes. Um, are there any more questions for Dr. Morris before we finish tonight? For back pain, not responsive to physiotherapy and no red flags, when can they do steroid injections? Um, I think the thing about steroid injections, you need to, you know, it's, it's, it needs to be targeted. So I guess once you, if you think you know where the back pain is coming from, um, then it's reasonable to do an injection of that, to trial an injection um, of that location. Um, sometimes people will use like the MRI for looking for edema and if there was no edema there, they might say, well, we think it's unlikely or they might use bone scans um, to help them try and localize where the pain is coming from. Um, and if you really, yeah, so I, I think in, the, in those situations, if, if there's no red flags and if you have a specific site, then it's not unreasonable to try an injection, but you need to, you generally need to um, either send them to a, the, like a neuroradiologist who will do their own assessment as to whether it should be periradicular or facet joint or have your own, have already established um, your provisional diagnosis as to um, what level and which, which particular structure needs injecting. Dr. Nan, did you have a comment there as well? Yeah, I think just to add on would be to, without knowing the level, it's very hard to blindly inject the back. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, uh, as Sarah was mentioning earlier, it's important to identify, are we injecting the facet joint? Are we looking at a neuroforamina? So uh, that information becomes very important. And again, as a diagnostic, or are we looking at it as a treatment modality? Uh, all of those uh, need to be taken into account. Okay, the next question is, can I write MRI plus minus US guided injection, ultrasound, sorry, guided injection? Um, you could, but the, I, I guess it depends what it's of. So um, firstly, we wouldn't do them at the same time because the MRI, by the time they process the images, um, send them through, someone has looks through them properly, um, you wouldn't have, it wouldn't happen in the same setting. So the ultrasound would need to be booked subsequently. And it's a bit, and, and it, again, it's a bit like, um, I guess if, um, we generally expect to have a, a specific injection um, requested. So if you if you um, said, for example, oh, what's an example? I, I, we probably get it more often with the ultrasound, but it, the same principle applies. So if you said patient, um, dequer, question about dequer veins ten, tendonitis plus, plus minus injection, and then in that situation, if they had dequer veins tendonitis on ultrasound, then we're thinking, well, we've confirmed what you're suspecting and an injection is reasonable, so we'll do an injection. MR, I mean, I guess if in MRI you had a specific specific provisional diagnosis and you're saying, please confirm on the MRI and then do the injection, that would be fine. Otherwise, um, the MRI, we, because it's a regional scan, usually we're, we're usually commenting on a, on, a, on a whole lot of different structures. We wouldn't normally go straight to an injection because we haven't done a clinical assessment. We've only done the MRI assessment. So I'd say yes, on the, as, as long as the it was indicated what structure um, you were wanting us to inject. And then we could consider whether the MRI supported that provisional diagnosis and therefore made the injection appropriate. But it would be a subsequent booking. It wouldn't be on the same day. Okay, the next question, is ultrasound adequate for abductor tears or do we need MRI assessment? Um, abductor as in uh, gluteal tendons, I'm assuming. Um, or do abductor, you mean yes. Abductor, ADD? Or ADD. 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 Um, it's a bit patient dependent again. So some patients we can see it very clearly and um, it's, it's fine. Other patients, if, particularly if they're bigger patients, the visualization is suboptimal and, um, and it's not great. And I guess the other thing is with ultrasound, we see the attachment, so we see it up at the pubic bone. But if you're talking about an adductor muscle strain, so uh, sorry, an adductor muscle tear or strain um, a little bit away from the origin at the, at the pubic um, bone, then our sensitivity on ultrasound will be less. 
Um, and so therefore you might need an MRI. So I guess it's reasonable to try ultrasound. If the ultrasound doesn't show it and you think clinically um, that's still what the problem is, then do an MRI in that context. But ultrasound can show it. So it's a reasonable position to start because it's cheaper, it's easier to access. It's, um, it's, a, it's a sort of a, it's an easier procedure to, do, to obtain and to have. The last question I have here at the moment is what imaging referrals from a physio would be accepted? Um, I guess two, there's two issues here. One, are you talking about from a, um, from a, from a um, medical ethical point, point of view? And the other one is the Medicare issue. So the Medicare issues, I think there's limitations by Medicare. I, I don't know them all, all off the top of my head as to what we can give Medicare rate rebates for. Um, I think... Um, Otherwise, from a diagnostic point of view, it's if it's especially for non-radiating. Um, I think I think I personally would accept um, referrals from a physiotherapist um, if I was comfortable. I understood the reasons for it. Um, so again, if I had all the clinical information, it made sense to me. It seemed reasonable from a medical point of view that that's the right study. Then I would have no problems from an ethical point of view doing an imaging study from a physiotherapist. But I can't say that. Um, they, we can Medicare rebate it if there's no Medicare rebate, if that makes sense. Okay, I think that's what they wanted to know. <laughs> so I can't, I, yeah, we can't change, we can't, we can't adjust the Medicare rebates. So um, we're that's out of our hands. Thank you. So um, we seem to have no more questions tonight. So I'd like to thank all of our speakers for taking the time to present tonight, and I'd like to thank everyone for attending. Um, I would like everyone to please complete the survey that will shortly pop, pop up on your screen after I close the meeting. Please note, if you are viewing the webinar on your smartphone, you may not receive the survey. You will, however, receive an email tomorrow, which will include the link to the evaluation survey. Please visit our website to register for more upcoming webinars, including our next Prince of Wales private event, Gut Health, on Wednesday the 5th of May. And thank you again to our speakers. It was a very informative night. And everyone have a great evening. Good night. Thank you.